Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BNH virtual event space, starting Monday off by ending the end of the series here, Basic Photography with Esteban Toro, sponsored by Sony. Today's our final part. We're going to be tying it up by talking camera sensors, more specifically, which camera should you buy? So for those of you who want to try out a new system or don't know what it's available out there, you're in the right place. Esteban, welcome. Hey, Derek, thank you very much. Welcome everyone to our final lesson today. Uh, we've been through different content all these days, talking how to use your camera, how to understand, how to capture. Uh, so now we will go to this very important question that it's what camera should I buy? Because I know all of you got this question. So stick with us and we will answer this one. Definitely. And I know there's some questions that were floating around the last couple of weeks that we didn't get to. So any questions here, we'll kind of wrap everything up and put a nice little bow on it for you guys. So if you guys have any questions on anything photography related, dump it into the chat or the comment section. I want to send a special welcome to everybody joining us on the simulcast on Vimeo, live stream, Facebook. If you guys do have any questions, you can drop it right in the comment section there, but I will turn it over to Esteban. Thank you very much, Derek. Hello, everyone. Welcome, as I was saying, to our last session today. Um, for those who are just joining today, we have been through different content where we have been talking about how to use your camera, what it means to be a photographer, uh, what it takes, what's the optic that you might need depending on the type of photography you want to do. Um, and today we will discuss how to, how to choose the right camera for you depending on your necessities. Um, but first, I want to go back to some questions uh, that I have had from all these days that you have sent to me in the, in the previous classes or even uh, through uh, social media, which I'm really thankful to receive so many messages and comments. It's, it's really cool to, to contact with you that way. Sometimes it's a little bit strange to be talking to the camera and feeling that I'm teaching and not seeing your faces. So this is really lovely that we can interact. It helps a lot, a lot, a lot. So we have this question that came after the last session that was like, how does the focus work? How do you focus your camera? Uh, I, know, I know many people struggle on that, especially they feel that there are many situations happening. So when I receive that question, the easy answer will, will be like, the focus works on contrast. So every time that you find contrast, the camera finds contrast, it will focus. But it's like, what? And, and how does that work? So then I was thinking like, how oh, I can show you that. And I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna make a slideshow of uh, pictures of uh, focus and out of focus pictures, but that doesn't make any sense when I'm actually using a camera to teach you. So I want to go and I'm gonna do something that I'm gonna experience for the first time. I'm gonna do this live using the camera and trying to show you how I actually focus. Uh, I hope it will make some sense and it will help you to clarify this, this question. Um, so let me just start moving some things here. I'm going to bring my camera to my view and I'm going to start showing you how it's going to work and what I mean when I say that the camera works focusing on contrast. Let me move my chair. I don't want to make a mess. We're live. Uh, the cable ho hopefully is long enough and I'm going to move you. Don't get scared. I'm moving you all, you all with me. And there we go. So what you're looking here, uh, it's basically my back road. And if you hear a little bit of noise, I don't know, we're in New York City and there's something, oh, there's a, uh, let me show you. I can actually show you this, this will be cool. You see all these bikes that are running there? That's the noise we're hearing. So apologies for that. Um, okay, cool. So let's go to focusing. So basically how it's gonna work and how I do it. Oh, it's really noisy. I don't know, can you hear me? Guys, well, <laughs> I want to show you this. Yeah, yes, we can. Let me just show you this. This is sweet. I love that this is happening. Like, it's real. Okay, but the important thing is that you can hear me. So, basically, how it's going to work. Uh, let's see, for example, you see the, the shadow that is created here in the building. Let me just reduce a little bit the exposure so you will see a little bit better. The, um, the 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 light shadow that is creating there if i it will be easier for the camera if i just like just put my focal point on this side so it will like in the middle in the let's say in, on the edge between the shadow and the light 
it will easily, and I just press the shutter, the shutters, the over here, let me show you this other camera. I just press here my shutter as I'm gonna take a picture. I just focus there. That's exactly what I'm doing here with my camera. And then immediately I'm focusing. It will be harder for my camera to recognize things and to focus on, to focus on things that are a little bit in the shadow. Cameras do pretty well focusing in the shadow, but still there will be places, there will be certain surfaces when there is no contrast where it will be really hard to focus. So be aware of that and always try to find kind of an edge. So it can be, for example, another point that I could choose is uh, the just the edge where the building, this building is with the sky. So if I just take my focal point there and I will just focus, it will it should focus very well. This uh, H and M uh, sign over here will help as well. So basically, where I have good light, it's really easy to focus. But sometimes we will have trouble. But it comes another question that is like, uh, and, and this question came came um, quite often. And it was like, Esteban, I try to focus, and sometimes I can't focus. So actually, I'm showing you my hand. This is intentional. I'm trying to focus my hand, and as you can see, I can't focus. So it's like, why? It's frustrating. Like it doesn't focus anyway or any yeah it does it simply doesn't work but it focuses on the on the on the foreground on the background so basically what is happening here is that there is another thing that we have to consider and that there's a minimum distance where i can actually focus with depending on the lens that i'm using so right now uh, on this camera i have a 24 70 millimeter uh, 2.8 g master so you will get an idea and it doesn't focus so so close so I can focus at certain distance and this will change depending on the lens that you're using. So anything that I'm looking here in all this background will be really easy to focus. As you can see, now it's out of focus. I will just press the, like, like half the way to the, um, the, um, the shutter and it's gonna, everything's gonna be in focus, which is really nice. If I want to do something close, then I will have to use something like this, use something like this lens that I have here that I know you will don't see much because it's in contrast. So this is what I have here is a 90 millimeter macro lens that basically the difference of this lens is that it will allow me to focus anything that is close. So let me do something very, yeah, very experimental here. I'm gonna remove the lens while I'm on this live. I hope this is going to work and I'm going to uh, use my 90 millimeter lens on the camera. So it's going to look like this. I'm changing the lens. You're seeing it in the live. And here I just changed my lens. Um, once I switch it, look, everything is out of focus. This here, it's my finger. I can just, I'm just going to open a little bit the, the aperture. So you all have more light. And now I'm able you can see all details from my hand and I'm able to focus. So basically what is happening here is that I have this, this possibility of focusing something that is very close. You can see all my hand. Let me, if you can see more is because it's a little bit dark, but here I'm able to see all these details. You can see all my finger, like my prints over there. And that's the reason why I will choose to use a macro lens, but I can also focus on something that it's all the way in the background. And then I have the same background uh, focus at here. So if you can't focus your picture, uh, there must be two reasons. The first one is that maybe you're too close to the surface uh, or to the, to the subject that you're photographing. And in that case, if your lens is not a macro lens, you might need to change it or you might need to like use a macro lens or maybe get a little bit further. Or the other reason is because there is no contrast on the photograph. So it's always a good idea. I, I like the macro very much because it allows me to do exactly this, to be able to change my focal point. It's very, very dramatic that this is something very special that I have with the macro lens that I don't have with the 24, 70 millimeter lens that I was using before. So this is the way I focus and I like it like, and we had the question in previous sessions, I'm just gonna change again my lens. So you will be able to at some point see me, but I know it's more important to see what it's looking in the camera. And um, 
the most important thing is that you will understand that focusing needs contrast. So always, if you can focus, try to find points where the light and the shadows or try uh, like our meeting, or let's try to find as well uh, places where like edges that are very, very contrasty like, like these ones or well, something like this. Another question that came up um, during the during these days is white balance and many questions we had about like what's exactly the white balance um actually white balance will mean that all uh, the white in the picture should look white so if i have a white wall and let me just open up my a little bit my you so you can see my framing this frame over here of my window is actually white it should look white if the white balance is correctly adjusted. However, uh, in certain situations, let's say I'm not taking this picture here with the frame of my window, I'm just taking a picture of my view. I really don't care that much that the white is looking white because actually what is white here? Probably the cars over here and a couple of structures over there, but that's not really what matters to me. So I prefer instead of calling it the white balance, I prefer to call it the, the color temperature. So I like to change it. So in every camera, it will be different. You will have to find exactly where in your camera you can modify the, the white balance or the color temperature or yeah, color balance. And you will have different options. Usually you will have something like a sun, uh, like, a, like a cloud, a shadow or maybe you will have the Kelvin uh, parameters that will help you to change it like way easier. But I just want to show you what's, what's really changing when you change the white balance. So if you look now, today we have a really beautiful day in New York City, very sunny. And it's almost, let's say like, like sunset. So the light is quite golden. If I'm going to take this picture, reality is that I will want to take something a little bit more warm. And I'm just going to change my um, white balance and I'm going to make it warmer. And if you can tell the difference, now it looks like the sunset is even more powerful. So I have used this multiple times when I'm, when I'm taking pictures of sunsets. I really like to use this uh, just to increase the temperature so it will look a little bit more warmer, but you can use it creatively. I can also go all the way to the other side and make it way more bluish. So you will notice how now it doesn't look like, like a sunset anymore. It looks more like kind of the blue hour, the last hour of the day. And of course it all, will have an impact on the perception that you have as a viewer. So um, you can use for these like uh, kind of a color conception of like concept of how you want the color to look like if, if you want something to look more like sad and low and, and relaxed, something more blue might work. But if I'm interested in showing like, oh, this is the, this is like New York in summer and it's very warm and very cool, I will just change the color temperature like this. Last time, last uh, session, we were discussing how, um, how, the, how the raw files versus the JPEG. One thing that you have to consider and that I will also like invite you to think, and let me, this is funny too, that you are not looking at me. So I will just uh, move again all my setting. That's me, that's my face. So you will see that this is, everything is happening live and I should be somewhere there. I think that's it. Something like this will be fine. So um, many times you will wonder like, okay, it's cool, but I want to like, do I have to think about the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, everything at the same time, while I'm also thinking about my, my, my white balance, if it's going to look warm or cold or not. Reality is that if you, if, you shoot in, if you shoot a raw file, you don't have to worry about it because after you will be able to change it and to modify everything, you will decide if it will look blue or like if it will look cold or warm. That's not going to be an issue. If you're shooting in JPEG though, 
you will have to take these decisions before. Because one of the things that I have noticed that it's harder, the hardest to change when you're uh, playing with the with the i with the with the JPEG files on editing is changing the white balance. The temperature, this color, if it goes too blue or too yellow, uh, will be a little bit more complicated to change. So these are things for you to consider if when you're gonna uh, shoot RAW or you're gonna shoot uh, JPEG. But I wanted to show you basically what you're able to change. So when you see all these icons in your camera, a shadow or just like a sun or a bulb, something like that, don't get too scared. Basically what it's doing is making the picture bluish or more yellow. That's all that is changing. So you have kind of decide the mood. Don't imagine that this is something like a filter because it is not. It's actually the changing the white balance and the temperature, the balance of the picture. But I don't want to get you confused with all this information. I just want you to know that you can make the picture bluish or more yellow. That's, that's in a general side how the white balance works. And the way I like to do it is look how cool it is. Now I can just play something with my, my light and now I look super yellow here. So I'm using this light here to, to have some, some good light on my face and I can play with it and I can make it, for example, I can decide to make it blue and I can create an interesting contrast or I can make the background a little bit more bluish and then I can make my light a little bit more yellow and I will also produce an interesting contrast. So it's all about playing with color and light. Uh, do we have questions until now before I go into the next thing? No, nothing. We had a question on white balance, but I think we, we covered that. So if anybody has any further detailed questions on white balance, please definitely throw them in. Was this too crazy, Derek, to move my camera and do all this? <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea. I think it was cool. And actually, I want to show you, um, I want to show you a little bit more uh, in, now that we have this possibility of uh, doing this live. And it's compression. Some of you also ask me about what is exactly compression? What, what do I mean by compression? So let me show you an example of how the compression is going to work. I'm going to use my telephoto lens and I'm going to, ah, I have a glass of water. So that's going to work perfectly. So let me just move my, my setup here. And we will talk more about focusing. So moving this camera over here. It's hard to move all this setup. I'm hoping that nothing will just get disconnected. Great. And once we're here, uh, as you can see, I have a glass of water here. Let me just adjust my tripod a bit. I'm just moving the tripod, making it a little bit lower. And here we are. Here we have a glass of water. So basically, uh, the way I can focus on this, it's like, Look, right now I will have my, I will adjust my settings and I will, uh, my aperture is 2.8. I'm gonna, I can reduce my, my ISO because it's a hundred now. So I'm just gonna reduce a little bit my aperture. Now it's 4.5. If you can see the city is in focus, but the glass is not. So what I'm gonna change is I'm just gonna focus here on the border of this glass with the city. So I'm just gonna move it there. I'm just gonna click there and it should, focus exactly the glass of water and now the city is blurry so this is gonna this is how it's gonna work i can just decide where i'm focusing the city or the glass i just change the focal point then if we want to talk about compression i want to show you the following now i'm a, at 35 millimeter uh, focal length if i change and i make my lens way wider the compression is gonna change. If you look carefully, I can, I can focus on the glass and still the background will look like you will understand that this is New York City, that there are some buildings in the background, right? That's because I'm using a wide angle lens. So you can see my hand here. If I just zoom in all the way and I use a 70 millimeter lens, immediately when I start focusing on the glass of water, it's like, you can still understand there is something in the background. There is kind of these buildings, there is something happening there, but it's harder to understand that this is a city or which city it is. So 
what I'm doing is compressing, it's creating, of course, like I'm creating, like the background is a little bit more blurrier, but also everything seems closer. So all buildings, the building over here and the building over there, they seem like they are too close with each other, which I can perfectly use to capture really interesting shots. Um, where if you have seen, for example, these pictures where there is a person who looks the same size of the moon and the moon looks huge, it's because the, the person is the glass and the moon is just the building. So it looks absolutely big, but look how different reality is. Like the building over here, it's actually way closer and way bigger than the building over there. That's what I meant when I was talking about the compression of the lenses. And this is just using the zoom lens that I'm having here, that is the 24 70 millimeter lens. So that being said, that's all the interactive part of, of our class today uh, of how it's gonna look. Let me just get back to my setting and we will continue our class. Do we have any questions so far? We do. I don't know if you wanna jump on this now. We had a question asking what the difference is between RAW and TIFF. Oh, great question. Basically, um, the way I see it and the way I like to use it is that TIFF files will uh, work especially for printing. When you want to print your pictures, when you want to, yeah, especially printing, I will go for TIFF file. It's something that I will edit my RAW file and I will just go and export it as a TIFF. And the, the reason why I will export it as a TIFF is because I don't want to lose information, as much information as the JPEG compresses. So I will just save a TIFF file to send to my printer, and then I will start working from there. So, any other question? Yes, we do actually have a question on uh, buying used gear. Uh -huh. So start, start the convo, joining, joining us from Facebook is asking specifically about a Nikon D750, but I think we can open this up and broaden it to talk about all used gear. Uh, it says, not too comfortable with the used camera. However, two instructors have told him it is the camera they need to buy to advance from the current camera they have. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you have your own thoughts on used gear. Uh, I think it's like buying used gear. It's like buying a new car. Basically, you have to make sure that the camera is working properly. Uh, and especially you have to take care of how many pictures have been taken with the camera because every camera has like a, a life a life cycle. So if the camera has plenty of pictures and what is plenty of pictures, more than 300,000, uh, of course that, that's gonna depreciate the, the, the whole value of the camera. Um, but I will definitely think about a second camera. And actually I remember my first full frame and I'm gonna get what is a full frame camera it was a second hand camera and it worked perfectly cool. Uh, I will just make sure that it, it works good. I would just suggest you to go maybe to some technician that you will agree with the person who's selling the camera. Like, hey, let's meet up in with this technician and that they will check that everything is working, that there is no humidity, that there is no fungus on the camera. And um, what's the life, the possible life of the camera before it gets like, a, yeah, it expires. Uh, besides that, I think it's a really good alternative to to buy any like to buy new equipment. But of course, it's way more expensive. Any other question over there? Perfect. That is it for now. Cool. I'm just gonna decrease my um, white balance so I will not look like I'm burning somewhere in hell. And I'm just here. I'm focusing, and I'm back to the studio. All right. So. Um, we already talked about the, the um, uh, like all the things that we have to consider before uh, buying the camera, except one thing that is really important. And for that, I'm just going to share my screen. And let me show you. So uh, let me mute my camera so you will be able to see the whole screen. Um, we have been discussing about full frame and last time we had questions about micro four thirds and we have heard about APC, APS-C and what is, what's all the meaning of that. So when we talk about a full frame camera, that it's uh, the one you have here on the top, top uh, left side of the, picture, of the graphic, 
a full frame camera comes from the idea that a film camera was a 35 by 24 millimeter size of film. That was the space that physically will take the, like will be printed on the film when you take a picture. When we switch over all the way to, to uh, digital photography, we consider that the full frame was gonna be the same size of a regular film camera. So after that, and because producing uh, all these sensors are a little bit expensive, um, camera producers have to create like smaller, smaller, smaller sensors that help help us to uh, that now we can have cameras in our cell phones. So if you look, I have I have phones there, and uh, basically what it means is that you can use the camera of your cell phone. And here, for example, in the iPhone, you have three cameras. So basically, what you're having here is three different sensors uh, with three different lenses that are processing the the images that you're taking. So you have different sizes and the only reason why you will care about this is because of the following every sensor has a limit of how many pixels and this is physical like if you look at the sensor of the camera let me just show it to you if you look somewhere there is the sensor of the camera if you look at the sensor of the camera you have to understand that uh, there is a maximum size that you are allowed to a maximum number of pixels that you're allowed to put in there. So when you have this maximum number of pixels, that's the resolution you can get for a photograph. I don't like that I'm out of focus. Let me just fix, fix that. Cool, I just focus here, I think so. Um, so basically what you're having, when you're having the, the, whole, the whole size of the sensor and you're just splitting it in different, like um, pixels in millions of pixels, the more you split the sensor, the less, the smaller the pixel will be. The smaller the pixel will be when it receives more light and you force it through the ISO, the more noise you will have. The bigger the pixel it is, uh, the less quantity of megapixels that you will have because you will not be able to say like it has 61 megapixels, but it has 31 but more like we'll be able to enter that small pixel and you will have less noise. That's the reason um, why many camera producers have been um, creating different models of cameras where you will have uh, one camera with a lot of megapixels, like plenty, insanely amount of megapixels and another one that doesn't have so many megapixels. That's what actually happened. And that's how Sony started with the, the A7S and the A7R, the difference between those is that the S will have way less pixels, but they will be able to, these cameras will be able to reach a higher ISO level without getting more noise. And uh, the other cameras will have less ISO, but way more resolution. And now the question comes like, okay, and what exactly do I need? Do I need resolution or do I need ISO? And that will depend, of course, on your personal, uh, your personal preferences and how you want to work with your camera. In my personal situation, my case as a photographer, I love to print my pictures. I sell uh, printed images, I do exhibitions, I print books, so all that is important to me. And sometimes uh, I'm in situations where I have to crop images. So I know, let's say I'm in Africa, in Kenya and I'm doing a safari and there's a lion and I have my 200, 600 millimeter lens, but the lion is further than that. So I just have to take the picture. I can get closer and then I have to crop. So if I need to crop or if I need to print my images, yes, I will need more resolution. If you're taking pictures only to post it on social media, if everything that you're doing goes to screens, any type, any size of screen, basically with any resolution that you might have, uh, you will be good to go. Meaning that in that case, I will prefer uh, to be able to increase my ISO, have less noise and be able to take pictures somewhere else. And this does make a difference. And you can see actually in the current market, uh, different references and yeah, model, camera models that make a huge difference. Like, and let me, let me put you a real uh, life example. 
I think you all know this marvelous camera, the uh, Sony A1. Uh, it's a fantastic camera with uh, amazing video qualities and yeah, like features. It's, it's really incredible camera. I still prefer the A7R4 for myself because the A7R4 Sony will have it's 11 more megapixels, a million of pixels uh, than the a Sony A1. And even though that the Sony A1 will record 8K and have a better profile, it's a newer camera, these 11 pixels make a difference in my work. Uh, will it make it in yours? That depends. I know that, and especially nowadays, there is plenty of people who work only to photograph or yeah, cover things for uh, social media or websites and stuff. So you will not really need those cameras. That's about full frame cameras. Now, do you need a full frame camera to be professional? That will also depend. Depend exactly on what? On the work you are doing. Um, I, I think I have had this conversation plenty of times with Derek. Uh, he loves his, um, you use an APS-C, C, right? That's the camera he, you're using. I, I use APS-C and medium. Great, so that's what you have. Uh, APS-C C will help you to be really compact. So you will have a really small camera that will allow you to go and do street photography without being noticed or don't be so flashy with a huge camera, massive lens and all that. Uh, whilst I, but maybe Derek is thinking like, okay, I need to print a book, but I printed in, in a specific size. Um, I would prefer to have a giant file to print my photograph. But that again goes to the personal preferences that you will have as a photographer and the personal interest. Of course, there is a huge benefit of using APS-CC and it's that uh, it's less expensive. The camera is less expensive. Uh, you will have a different type of lenses because it will change according to the format of the camera. But basically it will be, yeah, a little bit less expensive. Let me share with you my experience. I was dreaming dreaming to change my camera, my APS-C C at the time for a full frame uh, and I couldn't afford it. And I was 100% sure that if I will invest on in a full frame camera, I will have a better equipment and I will be a better photographer. So I saved a lot of money just trying to get this camera. And reality is that when I got it, I was very disappointed because I just started taking pictures and I downloaded to my computer and I was looking what I was taking before and with this camera and it was exactly the same. And I was like, wow, now I have a more expensive camera. I have to buy more expensive lenses and I get the same results. So why I decided to switch? Just because I heard that full frame is so powerful, that full frame is so important, that professionals shoot with full frame, which is a lie. Many photographers also shoot with APC, APS-C C cameras. Um, so it's, it's important that you don't let yourself drive by these emotions of, uh, what cameras are you using the pro photographers, but what camera exactly do you need? And there is really a market for everyone. I, I, I don't know where is my little camera, the Sony RX, um, a thousand Mark six. It's an incredible, powerful camera, uh, very, very small, very compact that I use all the time. Um, I like it very much. It's very trustable. And I use it every time that I don't need a huge uh, file to print. So I think the question in this, in this topic many times goes like, what type of photographer do you want to be? Do you want to be a photographer who prints? Do you want to be the photographer who posts on social media? That's the question you will have to ask. And many times I, I struggle a lot every time that I'm uploading uh, pictures to my website, my web designer tells me like, can you please send me a smaller file? That's too big what you're sending to me. And I get it. It's, it's actually way too big for, for web. Um, so there are different formats that you will, you will find. I just try to summarize in this graphic some of the most famous ones. Uh, as I told you, there are really small ones like the mobile phone ones, and then you have full frame and there are bigger formats like medium format that Derek also mentioned he uses. Uh, and then you have uh, just film like film plates that are super big and you have the biggest cameras that have been created. They are just like 
massive plates that they just just take pictures of like i have seen like this size of of just like a copy of the of the direct picture um so it all depends on what you're shooting on on what you um are looking for um so it's the question when when people ask like what camera should i buy in order to start as a pro photographer goes more into what type of photographer do you want to be and let me just go into this question that I'm sure it will come that it's like, okay, I'm sure, do you prefer to invest in camera bodies or lenses? And immediately my answer will be invest on lenses. I told you my experience, I was really like, oh, I need the most pro camera that I can find. And then I got my full frame and I didn't spend much money on lenses. And reality was that I was just like, I didn't know this information. Um, I was being kind of naive. So it took me a while to discover that if I invest in optics and really good optics, I was getting better results than I was getting uh, with better cameras, if that makes sense. With this, I'm not, I don't mean to say that good, like better cameras, newest, the newest cameras aren't good because if you know how to use these tools and if you, when, when let's say Sony releases a new camera and you read the description and you find features that you will really use and you know how to use them, then yes, it's worth it to change. If not, if you still are like kind of understanding this world of the camera, uh, you're good with what you have. So don't be like me, don't go like crazy to buy the, the most expensive camera because it will not make you a better photographer. Just, yeah, this, this is more, uh, reflection on, on my own career. Um, let me show you some of the models. Well, I don't, uh, Derek, do we have questions so far? Nothing right now. No. Let me see if we got anything that came in. Well, Reed is asking if it is possible to get a copy of your slides that you've used in the five presentations. They sure. are excellent. How we can how we can share them? We'll share with them. Direct. Uh, we'll throw your email. Esteban, what email did you want us to throw? And we'll put that in the chat if Reed wants to reach out. Yeah, uh, Esteban at estebantoro.com. Easy. Perfect. And you so, can just ask me and I will send you all these graphics for sure. I know perfect. they are very useful. Or you can just take screenshots. So I'm going to um, uh, jump into, I want to go and show you a little bit like more of cameras because I know it's like, okay, you already explained us, but it's still like, what camera should I get? And let me show you the one that I uh, is my favorite uh, until now from everything that Sony has produced it is the Sony A7R4. Uh, so basically what we're discussing here, what, what I show you is like this camera is showing me that it has 61 megapixels. Uh, so this is what I'm interested. Like, okay, it has a lot of resolution. It has 61 millions of pixels. That's MP, the meaning of megapixels and full frame body. So now I understand that it's the same size of a film camera, uh, which might be interesting for me. And there's more information that I can start reading. Like for example, the resolution of the video, it's something that it's also important for me, how many um, focal points I will have in my system and the, the reference of the processor, stuff like that. Uh, this is something that I will be really interested in looking at. And if I compare, look at the 60, this is 61 megapixels. If I compare this one with the Sony A7 IV, not 7R, but 7IV, uh, it will show me that this one has 33 megapixels. Uh, but actually look something very interesting in the key features that BNH and Sony decided to show you as a customer is that this camera will be able to go a very high number of ISO, uh, which is, the, the reason is that the sensor is uh, the same size of the say, A7R4. Uh, the difference is that they put less uh, pixels into the camera, into the sensor. So it's a smaller resolution. Uh, it also has 4K video and other features that uh, we could start discovering. But my, my main interest when showing you this is that these are two cameras that uh, are very powerful, the latest cameras that they have. And of course, I will go to the Sony A1 that I consider it's an amazing camera. It's, you know, it's like this, this uh, kind of a war tank that Sony produces just to, to do anything that any pro might need. 
So you have 50 megapixels, uh, you have 8K in video if you're shooting video and you have other really interesting features. But uh, the reason why I decided to keep with my a Sony a7R4, it's because of these 11 megapixels of difference because I print. That's uh, very important, no any other reason. There are other cameras. Uh, I know that maybe you're looking at prices and you're like, wow, this is, this is money. So let me show you other options like the Sony A6600. Uh, this is a really amazing camera, way more into the budget of uh, someone who's starting into photography. Great camera, very useful. And every time I feel Sony is doing a better job just uh, creating more and more precise small bodies of cameras um, uh, that you can that you can use to to start and to begin. This is 24 megapixels. That if you compare with the 60 megapixels that I show you of the uh, a Sony A7R4, you will think like, wow, but that's that's a huge difference. Like, it, it would it be enough? And reality is that 21 megapixels it's a lot to start working. Uh, if you want to edit your pictures, all these will allow you to shoot in RAW files, stuff like that. Let me show you as well the Sony RX uh, 100, six, six, seven, seven is the latest one. Uh, I, call, I call this camera, it's a point and shoot, uh, but it's one of the best cameras that I have had in my hands. Uh, many people tend to underestimate it until they use it. Uh, it's really powerful. It has a really powerful zoom lens uh, included that you're not able to just to switch over, but it's really powerful and the sensor, it's, uh, it's great. The resolution you get, uh, it's, it's really, really powerful camera. So this is another one you can start looking into if you're looking into the Sony world uh, of cameras. Uh, so of course, Sony has become famous for its mirrorless cameras and full frames that are uh, very used by pro photographers. But there are other, uh, yeah, just type of cameras that you should be considering as well. Uh, and uh, if we don't have questions till now, that I let me check here if we have some questions. Nope, I think we don't. No, nothing. Right no, cool. I want to, I want to, I want to jump into my website and talk to you about something that I consider very important, and it's how I become a faster photographer. We have been talking about how to um, modify and create, a, you know, like use the shutter speed, the aperture, ISO, all that. But how do I take the decision of, uh, of, of how I become a better photographer? Everything that we have been discussing is very technical. It's very, related to equipment and uh, things that are important to learn that in other uh, lessons I have told you that it will take you if you practice constantly around a year to learn. Uh, but the most important thing is what's happening in front of your camera. Everything that is in that frame, everything that is in your composition, and unfortunately in this basic workshop, we will not start uh, talking about composition, maybe a little bit, with this part, but everything that happens in front of your camera, the light, what you're photographing, where you are, and the connection you have with your subject, even if your subject is a landscape or how much planning you put into creating a photograph, it will definitely impact on how good your picture is. We have been talking about how to use your camera in manual mode. I have, to, I have uh, shared with you how to control aperture, shutter speed, ISO. But reality is that in our cameras, we have this uh, beautiful and very useful um, setting that is called auto, automatic. If you just set it to auto, the camera will measure everything as you do with your cell phone. You just take your cell phone out and you take the picture. You're not thinking about aperture, shutter speed, freezing the image or motion, nothing of that. The camera will take those decisions. Um, what really matters is what's in front, what is happening here. Uh, of course, having the chance of shooting in manual allows you to take creative decisions like how's the depth of field is going to look like, 
how's the if you're gonna freeze the image stuff like that but more important than that is definitely what's happening in front so all these pictures have been created by taking the time to plan ahead to think how or where i'm going to be taking these photographs from to understand and plan and especially being patient uh, staying at one place trying to understand how this let me just describe you how this place looks like this is a huge uh, lake and they are parking all the boats there and i'm just using the 70 to 100 millimeter lens it helps me to compress so as i show you with the buildings today all these uh, little boats seems like the same size and very close one to another and she's just standing there and the kind of the size of her body changes because i'm using the compression of the lens so if I understand all these techniques and all this technical knowledge, it helps me to take better pictures. So I'm just all the time analyzing like, okay, uh, if I were gonna take a picture here, what I will be using. And that's, that's a really smart way of starting to improve your photographs. And another way, another tip that I gave you in a lesson before that, but I want to stress on that one is if you see a picture that you really like, that really inspired you, and you're like, wow, this is a beautiful image, after you go through the beautiful feeling of feeling inspired, try to understand how this photograph was taken. Was it during the morning? Uh, is, is it using uh, artificial light, natural light? If it's natural light, where the person could be standing? Um, what lens the person might be using? Uh, what's in the background? This is something that I ignore for years uh, taking photographs. I ignore, and I have noticed this in many, many students that I have had, they care for what's in front, uh, but they don't care what's in the background, what, what you're sharing there. Everything that is in the frame matters. So if you look at my portfolio and my picture, there's no element in the picture that I haven't seen that I want to be there. I know it sounds like a lot, especially when you're thinking about all this technique, uh, technique aspect of photography, but it's possible that you start training it. And you don't need to like, and, and I will suggest you to take it as two different uh, sides. You can start learning how to photograph and taking the manual pictures and learning all this technique, but you can also start practicing only using your cell phone or just setting your camera to auto. Uh, or just even without the camera, just go somewhere and try to understand how I will take a beautiful picture from this place. I have done it in every place that, that I go. Um, even I'm in my studio and I think like, huh, this angle will look nice. Oh, look at this reflection. Oh, look at this certain thing that I can do. And that's how I start like kind of forcing my, my brain to work as a photographer. And then you start taking pictures all the time and that really inspire you to create more and more images. Um, so another thing is after you've been through the shock of seeing a beautiful image, it's like, okay, this, I can see this picture and it looks like uh, the mountains look very far in the background. So I can tell that this is a wide angle lens and the light okay i can see that it's a little bit of the sunset so he's using a sunset light and is it freezing or is it a motion picture in this one it's hard to tell uh because you know like there is no reference of something that is moving so it can be either a tripod or just a just one one snap although i can see something here in the water and i will just zoom in and try to understand how this picture was taken and then I understand like, okay, this has a really deep depth of field. So that works for, to understand how this picture was taken. There is no noise. So for sure, the photographer was using a real low ISO. Um, let me go to a more challenging picture. I think I already show you this one. Uh, so let me just try to go to another portrait. So I look at this picture and I think like, okay, he's close to the subject and look at something interesting. The model is looking at the photographer. Uh, I like to call them models. He's not a model. He was a, he's a real person, but I like to yeah, call them model. The model is looking directly to the camera. Uh, there is connection. 
the shape is like you can see that he looks like the shape of his face looks accordingly with his body so it can be more like a 50 85 millimeter lens uh, and there is nothing in the background there is a black background how the photographer did it maybe it's still unknown for me but but i can start getting some feelings of what lens the photographer is using i can tell that a person a portrait is just something some action that you have to freeze because we're breathing and blinking with our eyes so i can start to understand how this picture was taken if i look carefully at details i can understand in this photograph that uh, she has like her face is in focus but everything that is happening here a little bit behind the uh, the, uh, like like the cover over the, on her face it's getting out of focus so i can tell that the photographer was using a really wide aperture like 1.4 maybe and then i can start understanding and kind of like just putting into pieces how the picture was taking pictures that i like and then i'm able to understand that when i'm going to take these pictures if I like it, it's probably working in my taste. So I will try to replicate it when I create a portrait. That's the best way that I like to learn and to discover um, how to photograph. Uh, you can see this picture is I'm freezing the action. They're staying there playing with the with the um, with the um, soccer ball. So basically, what what's happening there is that they are just uh, I'm, I'm just with a really uh, short shutter speed i'm just freezing the moment and that's all you can tell even that he in the background is a little bit out of focus so i can tell that the photographer was using maybe a wide aperture and i can start just reading how the pictures were taken these my friends it's my most sincere advice on how to learn photography how to become fast in this there is nothing that will make you faster than practicing, breeding, and eating photography every single day. There is no fast track. There is nothing else you can do. There is no magic tricks. There is no better camera, no better lenses that will uh, improve besides time and practicing. And I think that's how we all uh, photographers build our trajectory and we discover the style that we like because uh, this is something that happens as well that we we think like okay but i like everything i like travel i like street i like portrait i like food photography so what i'm gonna do my suggestion explore everything and start working on the ones that you feel that you are more connected with this is how i became the photographer that i am today either good or bad you will be able to judge it but this is how I started in photography. I would like to have some minutes to have some Q and A if there's some questions coming in. Yes, definitely. I'm I'm just gonna jump on one quick because I was in the middle of typing an answer to Diana, but so I'm just gonna finish it over here. So, hello, Diana. Uh, thank you for for joining us. So Diana was asking; she was a little confused before on the talk between sensor size in relation to noise and she prints and often shoots in low light situations. So she struggles with choice of sensor size. So I'm gonna just throw in my two cents here instead of finishing my, my writing. Um, it's more about the pixel size than sensor size. Yeah. Think pixel size, it's not advertised. Most people aren't out there, they're not choosing cameras and, and camera manufacturers aren't manufacturing cameras based on pixel size but it's the pixel size that has the bigger impact. Sensor size doesn't matter in, in regards to noise. So if you think of um, you know, a, a sensor and say you have one, the sensors, two sensors and they're both the same size and one has bigger pixels, when light is hitting that sensor, um, the photons that are hitting the, you know, these pixels, you're gonna get more on the bigger pixel, right? It's gonna be able to pick up more. So there's going to be other other stuff that's you know this this misdirected light that's going around to just to kind of simplify it and put it in non technical terms um, that's going to create noise, but generally you're going to see a smaller pixel size on something like a cell phone and for example like an A7R4 is going to have a larger pixel size so that's why it's able to handle the noise better in noise low better. light situations high high ISO situations so in 
Diane, if you do, if you did want to reach out on the side and, and if we can kind of go into the weeds on that, it's a very complicated discussion, but I will say this, um, I shoot on an APS-C and I shoot almost exclusively these days at night and I print and I've put out multiple publications and doesn't really don't, don't limit yourself based on sensor size, and pixel sensor size. size. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's, it's really about the content that you're producing and grain is sexy. Noise is sexy. It looks good in images. And, and we don't have to lie to ourselves that uh, nowadays camera producers, manufacturers are creating better and better cameras. I mean, the, when I tell you this theor theoretically, like A7R4 shouldn't be used for high ISOs. Um, I use it when I need, whenever I need, I just raise my ISO and I use it and I use the pictures. I don't mind. And it works perfectly. And the same if you need to print uh, a good image is a good image, even if it's uh, not with the highest quality available on the market. So I, I totally agree uh, with Derek on this. It's, it's a matter of that. If you're struggling with these two cameras, uh, usually the decision will be, the wiser decision will be to, to have the two cameras, one for um, very dark places where you need to, uh, yeah, just use high ISO and another one for just printing. The problem is when it mixed together and you have to decide immediately, then you just have to take the decision like which, which camera you will shoot, what's better, what's most important for you. Uh, Reed is asking, what percentage of your time do you spend on post-production? If taking a picture is 100%, then how much of that time do you use in post-production? Uh, I can, uh, you know, I think we have, uh, these questions about post-production have come constantly. <laughs> we like. But basically, I, I can spend one, two minutes uh, just post-processing one picture. So if you put it in perspective, it's like I spent a few, uh, like a frame of a second just taking the picture, and I spent minutes taking like post-processing the picture. But if I see the whole process, is like my post-processing is like at 20, 25% of my time just taking the picture. I spent more planning. Planning the picture takes me probably 60% of my time um not much taking the picture then another time just post-processing and then doing something else with the picture printing it selling it doing doing something else so yeah uh, but the, it usually takes me one two minutes uh, in front of the computer i love computers but i don't like to spend so much editing one single image definitely well esteban i want to thank you for coming in and, and educating us throughout this series. Of course, thanks Sony for sponsoring this series and all of our viewers who chimed in, tuned in, watched, got their questions asked and answered. And you guys have Esteban's information there. If you guys do want to reach out, definitely shoot him a follow on Instagram, Esteban Toro M as in Michael. Um, and if you guys do have any questions, we're always here for you. This is what we're here for. Free education for the masses here at the BNH event space. Uh, but this is it. Another round. Of the BH virtual event space is in the books. Time to say good night for now. We'll see you guys back here tomorrow. We have a full day planned. So I will leave it with that. Esteban, thank you again. Have a wonderful night to all thank of our you viewers. Very much to all of you. Thank you guys.